Hello, Chart Watchers, and welcome to this Tuesday, December 11th, Market Watchers Live Show with your host, Tom Boley and Aaron Swenlin. For those of you joining us for the first time today, welcome to the show. And for our regulars, welcome back. Well, we've got a uh, continuing rally off of uh, yesterday's uh, bounce, uh, but we are off the earlier highs. You can see the Dow Jones Industrial Average currently up 64 points, the S&P 500 up 13, the NASDAQ up 57, and the Russell 2000 small caps up about nine points. Ten-year Treasury yield, this is a problem. We're not seeing money rotating out of Treasuries. Uh, that would be, or that would result in a higher TNX reading today. You can see it is flat, 2.86%. So money is not rotating back out of Treasuries. That could be a problem later today. Volatility index uh, got up to 26 yesterday, reversed back down. Today it is down a little bit, down about 1%. Um, we'll have to watch the volatility index, but if the S&P goes red and that volatility starts to move back to the upside, we're going to want to keep a close eye on the 2582 level on the S&P 500. Uh, consumer staples uh, leading the market to the upside. You can see consumer discretionary also moving higher. So consumers or consumer stocks certainly leading the action today. Uh, on the downside, the two laggards from yesterday, energy and financials, both lagging again today. And then finally, the uh, top stock in the S&P 500 today is Twitter. Uh, Twitter's up 5%, challenging the late October, early November highs, trying to uh, get a break out there. And the uh, worst performing stock in the Dow today is Pfizer, which was downgraded. Uh, Pfizer down about 1.22%. Okay, Aaron, well, yesterday we saw the S&P get down to 2583, one point away from that key low close back in February. We bounced. Tried to bounce earlier today, but we're reversing off those highs. Uh, I don't know. It still doesn't look very good to me. No, I have to agree. I'm still, uh, I'm waiting for some good strength. So honestly, I can get out of some of my long-term investments. I I was hoping this might be the opportunity, but now we're already starting to reverse. So I don't know. Keep an eye out on this one. But eventually, we have to move up a little bit. We have to get a rally here a little bit. Yeah, I'm not throwing the towel in just yet. I mean, we do have a higher high and higher low in from yesterday. We gapped up. We're going back down. Perhaps we'll fill the gap or get close to it and turn back around and strengthen later today. But I just don't like the fact that 10-year Treasury yield is really – we're just not getting any bounce there. So there's no money rotating out of Treasuries. And so you got to wonder what's going to fuel um, a stock rally. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Maybe a trade deal. I mean, that's one thing everybody's kind of waiting to see is – are we going to yes. get a free deal with China and what's going to happen if we get that? I really do think that would be a spark for sure. Um, I was telling people on my Decision Point show Friday, I had to give the uh, Timer Digest my um, uh, forecast, I guess you might want to call it, for the Dow all the way through next year. I think you might remember me doing it last time, but I was saying that trade, global trade was really going to be the key to next year to see what's mm -hmm. going to be happening. Yeah, and I'll be going over the shorting strategies later. I'm going to take a walk through uh, history into a couple of the last, uh, well, the last two bear markets, and we'll be looking at some of the price action, some of the things to look for. And so for me, it you know it would be difficult for me to give the tw my 2019 forecast. It's almost based on whether or not we see this breakdown or not, because to me, it's a difference between a correction and a bear market, and that's that can be a big difference uh, as we look ahead to the next year. Ah, uh, the life of the market timer. I, oh, I, I know. Short-term <laughs> trader. Why don't I just? Why don't I just do long-term stuff and forget? All this? <laughs> there you go. Timing stuff, though. Having to give people signals is always uh, a little bit. Uh, hmm. I'm used to it now, but I know in the beginning it was like, oh, I don't want to tell people to buy. I don't want to tell people to sell. Well, it's just you're not. a signal. It's an attention flag. That's yep. what. You're, I, just, you're just giving your opinion. Exactly. Everyone's got to make their own decision based on, on all the information that's out there. But anyhow, what we got going today? And all right. Yes, we need to get going because I know you've got a workshop coming up. Tomorrow we have Greg Morris, Bill Shelby will join us on Thursday. Mary Ellen uh, McGonagall will be back for What's Hot, What's Not and a co-host on Friday. And I have a workshop next Tuesday. Uh, I think I'm going to do it on just beginner concepts just to give a refresher to people, you know, uh, and those who I know there are a few people who do turn, tune in now and then that aren't really expert at this stuff. So I think I'm going to work on that for our next workshop. 
All right, shorting strategies, that's what you're gonna start off with after the technical news. Walmart is gonna be our first 10 and 10 symbol. And finally, we'll finish off with uh, technical scans. I'll be going through some of the bearish scans that you can use given the bearish, uh, you know, the way that the market's looking right now, so. All right, um, uh, technical news and headlines. I know we did have a little bit of uh, a few economic reports. Yeah, let's start off with uh, the PPI, Producer Price Index, for November. It did rise one-tenth of one percent. Market was expecting flat reading, so a little bit hotter than expected there. Core PPI was even hotter, up three-tenths of one percent versus one-tenth percent rise expected. Uh, when we take a look at the reaction in the uh, bond market, of course, I was just mentioning earlier, 10-year Treasury yield hasn't done much. And what I have, I've got this set up a little differently today. It's a uh, just a line chart connecting the, the closes on the 10-year Treasury yield on the top. And then this middle uh, chart here is the S&P 500, also with a line chart connecting the close. And then the bottom is your correlation between the 10-year Treasury yield and the S&P 500. And even on a daily basis, you can kind of see that this tends to stay mostly in positive territory, meaning that the direction of the 10-year Treasury yield and the direction of the S&P 500 more often than not move in the same direction. And so when you look at this and I see this ski slope on the 10-year Treasury yield, and then I see the bounce, the last bounce that we had on the S&P 500, there was nothing coming from the Treasury market to, um, you know, to push equity prices even higher. And when I see a disparity like this with the Treasury yield going in the down direction, the S&P going up, I've always viewed the, the bond market as the smarter market. Uh, the bond market seems to get it right more often than the stock market. Uh, and so when I see the S&P bounce and the 10-year Treasury yield keep moving down, you can see the S&P failed and ended up coming back down. So it wasn't equity markets leading the bond market higher. It was the bond market actually leading the S&P back to the downside. So now we've got a little bit of a rally, even though it's kind of fading today. We had that bounce yesterday, but the 10 year treasury yields going nowhere. So that to me is a little bit of a problem here. Uh, I'd like to see money rotate out of treasuries that should send the treasury yield higher. I wanted it to hold 3%. It didn't do that, continued moving lower. So this is definitely a short term warning sign in my opinion. Uh, so we wanna be careful as the treasury market is telling us things uh, ahead could be slowing down from an economic perspective. All right, uh, let's take a look at some of the earnings reports out. There were two out last night. Uh, I think I mentioned these yesterday. Casey's General Stores, CASY, did come in better than expected. Uh, they beat not only on the bottom line, as you see there, but also they beat on the top line and gave inline guidance. And then there was Stitch Fix. Uh, the bottom line looks good. Uh, even the top line looked good. They beat on both, but they lowered uh, their EBITDA, which is the earnings before um, interest uh, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. So they lowered next quarter's EBITDA. And sometimes this is the one that when we looked at yesterday, and I'll pull the chart up again in a little bit, but uh, when we looked at it, it had dropped about 50% in the last two months. And so the market tends to look ahead. So even though they beat in the prior quarter, the market is already thinking about what's going to happen in the next quarter. Uh, the technicals were telling us it wasn't going to be good. Fundamentals confirmed it last night. DSW Inc. also beat this morning, uh, and this was a nice report. They beat on the top line, beat on the bottom line, and they raised their fiscal year 19 revenue and earnings per share guidance. Later today after the bell, you can see Pivotal Software, American Eagle, and uh, Dave and & Buster's ticker symbol play. They will all be reporting after the bell tomorrow. Uh, NDSN reports Thursday, of course, is the big one. Uh, well, two big ones, Adobe and Costco will be reporting after the bell on Thursday. All right, so let's take a look at it before I actually I get into the earnings. Let's take a look at the S&P 500 because this is a problem that I'm having with the market right now uh, on an intraday basis. And let me make sure I have the latest price action. You know, if we're, if we're truly gapping up and we're trending higher, we should see the rising 20-hour EMA holding as support. Just like when we were trending lower, look at that failure right at the 20-hour we move lower. Now we get a little nice little bounce in the market yesterday. We hold right at 25.82. We get back up through the 20 hour. And unless we get a big reversal by the end of this hour, uh, we are breaking back down below the 20 hour. I don't know. It just doesn't seem uh, like a very good uh, solid advance, not a sustainable type of an advance, but maybe we'll reverse later this hour, hold that 20 hour, something to, to keep in mind and watch throughout the show. 
All right, let's take a look at a couple of these companies that reported earnings, CASY, Casey's General Stores. This is one, remember yesterday, talked about it was at a key area of gap support. It gapped into this gap support zone from September, and we've seen buying ever since. This was a company that had already anticipated good results. As I mentioned, they did beat top and bottom line. Inline guidance, though, and that may have uh, thrown some off at the beginning of the day where we see that gap down, but mostly buying since then. If we look at SFIX, which is Stitch Fix, this is the one that had dropped 50% from 52 and a half bucks down to 26 at the close yesterday. This is just a little bit more than two months, maybe three months. Uh, but anyway, it was uh, definitely under pressure. Uh, told us that we probably should expect some maybe not so good news. And that's exactly what Stitch Fix delivered. Uh, the last quarter's numbers weren't bad. But that was already built in from the prior gains. Recent actions telling us things going forward are not so good. And that's where that lowering of the EBITDA for next quarter came into play. So technicals do give you a lot of clues as to what you might uh, hear from a fundamental perspective. Last one, DSW reported this morning, big gap up earlier, struggling to stay above its 20-day moving average, has been downtrending for a while. Key area of resistance to watch, we've had three attempts to get through about $28.75, $29, and three failures. So even if we do rally uh, today, later today, and get back up above that 20-day, I think we're going to have some issues as we get up closer to $29. I know uh, there were a number of upgrades and downgrades, Aaron, so I'm going to turn it over to you. What do we have for today? All right, quite a few indeed. All right, let's get right to it. All right, I'm going to start with uh, the upgrades. Let's start with Allstate. And uh, Allstate today was upgraded by Edward Jones from a sell to a hold. I went ahead and uh, most of these upgrades and downgrades, I needed to move to a weekly chart because there were no real areas of support on the daily charts within the last year. So we have a lot of stocks um, you know, making new lows uh, for the year. So uh, a lot of these are gonna be weekly charts. So the first one I have here, let's go ahead and make this big. All right. So I, I went ahead and marked a couple of areas where, you know, we lost support at this low here in first quarter 2018. We we came down here, lost today. Uh, so far, we're losing the support right there at the low we had back in uh, the third quarter of 2017. And now, it, where are we going to go here for the next area of support? I mean, if you want to go to this low back here in uh, the second quarter of 2017, you could do that as I would look that at that as a like an intermediary uh, area of support. The place that I would be looking for is this area here where we had the highs that came in and you could see all the various touches from 2015 and 2016. I think that uh, Allstate is certainly vulnerable to that despite its upgrade. All right, Progressive was upgraded today by B. Riley from a neutral to a buy. And this one I found an interesting chart because we're coming down into what could end up being a double bottom formation. Remember, these are reversal patterns. So you really do need to come down into a double bottom. And that's exactly what it looks like is happening here. We need to get up here to that confirmation line at that top. Uh, we need to get there and pass through it in order to make it a true double bottom pattern. But it looks like one might be forming here. I don't like the PMO, but it is an oversold territory. So if we can get the momentum to shift, uh, I think Progressive doesn't look too bad here. All right, next one up, United Natural Foods. And this one was actually upgraded and downgraded today, uh, but really it was kind of a, um, we ended up in the same place. Uh, Pivotal Research downgraded it from a sell to a hold and upgraded, I'm sorry, from a sell to a hold and uh, Argus downgraded it from a buy to a hold. So ultimately we're on a hold for, for United Natural Foods. So I'm gonna, again, you can see lots of these charts, no support on daily charts. So we'll move to the weekly and see if that's helpful. It's still not helpful. <laughs> this tells you there's some real problems going on here. So now I have to move to the monthly chart. All right. And as you can see, this is going to be that really important area of support. I'm actually going to annotate it because I want to see how close we are to it right now. 
right there. And that's an intraday low. That also matches up with these tops we had back here in, um, well, 2002. Yep, 2002. Uh, and so we're hitting it right now. We're on that support level. I'm not going to be looking for it to hold here, though. I mean, obviously, we've been having all these problems. There's a, uh, a you know, a, an area that we had some consolidation. We've broken down from that. PMO is ugly right now on the monthly chart. So uh, certainly wouldn't be touching this one. It says that it's a neutral, like I said, a hold. But I, 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 I hope if you were holding this, that uh, you missed out on this really bad decline that started this week. Or this month, I guess I should say. This is a monthly chart. All right, next one up. Zynga was upgraded today. Zynga was upgraded uh, by Macquarie from a neutral to an outperform. So this is one that is uh, expected to rally. And I have to say, of all the charts, this one was probably one of the, the best looking ones, if you want to go there. I'll show you this parabola tool. This is a rounded bottom right here. I like to see these because, uh, you know, that usually is a nice slow uh, move. You know, you're getting that cup. And, you know, so we could see a little bit of a handle come back down here, but I'm looking for the breakout. I, I don't know seasonally how Zynga does, but uh, I suspect with the holidays it might do well. So we got this breakout from these these highs back here. Uh, this was an area that was support and then became resistance. You can see it also lines up back here with that double bottom. So I like this cup that we're seeing, a rounded bottom. And the PMO had a buy signal in oversold territory. So that is also uh, something to look for that I like to see. All right, let's, uh, let's see. We had two other upgrades that I'm not going to go over. AT&T was upgraded and Helmrich and Payne uh, HP was upgraded. So let's look at a few downgrades right now. Pro let's see, principal financial. Financials have had some difficult times. A weekly chart here, guys. Uh, I'm seeing the support level right here at these lows that we had in 14 and 15. You can see the high we had in 2016. You know, when you're looking for your support and resistance, you want as many touches on that line as possible. And that's why sometimes I will actually do a zone. But I think this one is pretty close. And we're getting ready to test that area. Uh, we are on a downgrade. If we can't hold that $41 area, um, hold on, because we're probably going to go down to 35 all right, Travelers also downgraded today from an outperform to a sector perform by RBC. This one has been really in a, a, a consolidation zone here. And when I looked at it, I thought, oh, that, that's you know not the best setup. But you know, if you're playing the, the traveling in a consolidation zone, we are at the bottom of it, if you wanted to, to consider it uh, and, and think about it as going back up to test that top of that zone. But I have a PMO sell signal. And as you can see, we've had really lots of uh, volume to the downside. Uh, I don't like the look of it. So I mean, if you wanted to try and get in there at the support level, if you get down to that 118, you know, you can give it a try, but I'm not uh, particularly fond. And it was downgraded. Uh, last one, Nutrisystem. This one was downgraded by B. Riley from a buy to a neutral. I thought this one was quite interesting. I did move it to the weekly chart because I wanted to see where this level matched up uh, as far as this new support level after the gap up. And it lines up almost perfectly with the top we had back here mid-2018 and the low we had back here in 2017. Uh, I think this is a good area that, you know, we had some strong resistance and we got above it. Uh, the only thing I would... Uh, tell you to be maybe concerned about is if we end up with an island type of formation. But looking at the weekly chart, we've got the buy signal and the PMO is headed up now in positive territory. So I thought that one looked decent. All right. Uh, the other ones that I'm not going to go over, Pfizer was downgraded. Schlumberger was downgraded. Stitch Fix was downgraded. And uh, that pretty much completes all of our upgrades and downgrades. All right, Tom. Your turn, time for your workshop. What do you got for us? Okay, well, today I am going to talk about shorting strategies, and I might be just a little premature because uh, we, in my opinion, don't have confirmation of the bear market. 
And I'm going to start by going back into the last two bear markets and show you how they set up and how we did get price breakdowns that led to both of those bear markets. So first, let's start with uh, 2000 and 2001. And so first thing I will do, uh, just make sure you can see that, Aaron. You got that chart okay? Sure do. All right. All right, so this is uh, 2000 and 2001 action. The S&P 500 on top. Of course, I've got the PPO up here, RSI. And the one line that I'm drawing on the RSI is RSI 60. Uh, normally, when you're in a bull market, you see RSI 40 hold during uptrends. Um, and when you consolidate, a lot of times you, you go between 40 and 60, sometimes even 30 and 70 if it's a pretty wide area of consolidation. But when you start trending and you start downtrending in a bear market, the RSI right around 60 is the level that you want to watch. So that's this horizontal line coming through here. Uh, then on the bottom of this chart, I've got the volatility index. So that's all that's showing on this chart. Price action with the PPO above, got the volume, of course, RSI and the VIX. Okay, so back in 2000, if you uh, were trading back then, you might not remember all the price levels, but we did go through a period of consolidation in 2000 before we rolled over and began the bear market. So we set a high back in March of 2000, and even though we didn't break out the new highs, we did go back and test that level a couple of times later in the year before finally, finally losing uh, what was pretty significant price support, which is marked here by this horizontal line right at about the 1330 area, as you can see. So each time we went up, we'd come back, we'd hold it. And it wasn't until we finally broke down with some gusto to the downside that I believe uh, confirmation of that bear market began. And that was in December of 2000. Uh, the last fateful move to the upside, we could not get through the prior high. Keep in mind that an uptrend is a series of higher highs and higher lows. A downtrend or a bear market is a series of lower highs and lower lows. So the first thing you have to do here is set a new low prior, uh, you know, when you look back at these prior lows. And so that was established in December. So now we've got a high from September, we've got the low in December, and we've got a downtrend in play. Now, for me, you've got to have patience when you're looking at a bear market. Um and, and even with a bull market, I think you have to have the patience to allow these bounces to occur. And you're, you really don't want to get aggressive and chase these when you're oversold. So, for instance, on this first low, um, and if we break down below 2582 on the S&P 500 now, I'm not necessarily going to be rushing into shorts as soon as that happens. I'm going to wait and allow the next bounce to occur. And from that point, depending on where we move back to, uh, I may get more aggressive. But here's your breakdown. Here was the move back up. At the breakdown, check out the RSI. The RSI is down near 30. You're pretty close to already being oversold because once you're breaking down, you're breaking down from earlier highs. You are already in a downtrend when you hit support, and then you continue moving down. And at the same time, you've got the volatility index jumping up into the, in this case, up above 30. Well, when you get a VIX up around 30, 31, you're already, there's already a lot of fear built into prices. That's not the time to be chasing moves to the downside to try to short. Instead, you want to let the market rebound. You don't want to see higher highs. So in this case, even if we take the short term, low, uh, you know, uh, low, high, uh, lower high, lower low, lower high, lower low, this bounce right here did not get above this prior um, high, which was at about the 1380 area. Notice also, and this is pretty important during bear markets, the PPO goes positive on the daily chart just temporarily. And as we go back down below the 50-day moving average, notice the PPO going right back down below the center line. Once you, or in my opinion, once you have a confirmed bear market in play, one of the best signals is going to be after you have a move back to the upside, when that PPO crosses and goes back below the zero line and we get price action to go back below the 50-day moving average, I think that is further confirmation that the bear market has begun. So those, these are some of the things I'll be looking for as we go forward, assuming that we break below that 2582 level that I've talked about. And I'll show you that chart in just a little bit. But notice each time we bounce uh, in March of 2001, 
We bounce here, get back to the 20 day moving average. We do it again later in March, 2001, bounce to the 20 day, and then we move back down. But on this lower low in terms of closes, you can see there we actually had a positive divergence. You wanna be careful with that. But on these bounces, you can see the RSI uh, coming back off of the oversold level. Again, I don't wanna be buying, or excuse me, shorting, when uh, I've already seen a month long decline and an RSI down in the 20s. That's telling me the stock market is set up for a bounce. So I wanna wait for that bounce to begin to exercise short positions. Now, if you look back, you can see a prior low here, just above 1250, a couple lows here, about 1270. And when we go up and hit the 20 day moving average here, it's also right at about key price resistance as well. So getting into short positions there, one of the benefits is you could keep a fairly tight stop because if the S&P 500 breaks out above the 20, you could simply get out with a small loss. You could cover the position on a breakout. So instead of thinking at uh, uh, or looking at the market and thinking in terms of long positions where you're looking for price support breakdowns, uh, from a shorting perspective, it's the opposite. You're looking for price breakouts. That would trigger a stop. You want to make sure you don't hold on. Um, you know, every, every bear market, every correction, every bull market, they can all set up differently. We can't just assume everything is going to be exactly like before. So even after getting a price breakdown, there's going to be a part of me that says, you know, maybe it's a head fake. Um, if it is, I want to make sure I have my stops in play. I don't want to get caught long term in a short position when the market continues to rally. So always have a little bit of skepticism. Even if you're convinced we're in a bear market, it makes sense to have skepticism and keep your stops in play. All right. So this was the the uh, bear market of 2000, 2001. Notice the volatility index. The other thing that I would avoid is getting too emotional and too bearish when, and it's easy to do, when the volatility index is screaming to the upside, that normally is a signal that you're going to get a big reversal. When it's gonna happen is hard to predict, but if you're just initiating short positions when the volatility index is already up into the 30s or upper 20s, you're probably setting yourself up for disaster because that, you can see these tops, almost every one of these bottoms, the major bottoms during a bear market, intermediate term bottoms, coincide with a volatility index that shoots to the upside into the upper 20s or into the low 30s. So if you thinking about putting on a short and you look at the VIX and you see it's already up at 30, I would probably hesitate. Um, actually, for me, I probably would avoid it. Uh, but just keep that in mind. Volatility, the bear market's very emotional and the volatility index is gonna be our guide through a very emotional market. Um, the last bottom you can see, the volatility index shot up into the 40s. That's somewhat unprecedented. When you get up into the 40s, you're looking at probably the bottom in a bear market. One exception was 2007 to 2009. So let's take a look at that one now. All right, this is the 2007 to 2009 bear market. Now, first I wanna point out again how we set an initial low, we come back down, we test it, notice these bounces. This is just sideways correction um, type of behavior. But early 2008, we broke down. And once we broke down, we rallied, in this case, we rallied back to the area of the breakdown, that's as far as we could go, pulled back again, held support, bounced one more time. And this actually was a false breakout in May of 2008. And trust me, it's a lot easier um, with hindsight to be able to say, okay, that's a false breakout. If you were in the midst of that trade, I guaranteed if I was shorting, I would have been stopped out with losses there um, because I wouldn't have taken chances on breaking out above these highs. But what happens after that? We roll over, we go back down below the 50, you can see the daily PPO turns negative again, and that begins the next slide, taking out the prior low. Now, once we get back down to this level, you can see clearly we are in a pattern of lower lows and lower highs, um, which is the hallmark of a bear market. Um, but all of these uh, moves here, you can see these arrows all pointing to these rollovers on the PPO at or near the center line. If we go above the center line, you're waiting for it to come back down and that move back below the 50-day moving average again. Those are going to 
most likely generate the best bearish short trades um, or best best short trades during a bear market. Again, be careful. Don't get too excited on the short side when you see an oversold market. RSI gets down to 30 or below. That tends to coincide with some pretty important short-term bottoms. And the same holds true for these volatility readings. So in 2007, 2008, you get these volatility, these moves up into 2000, or excuse me, up into the 25, 26, 27, maybe even into the low 30s. This area of uh, the volatility index almost always lines up with key bottoms in the market. So if you're shorting with the volatility index, upper 20s, low 30s, you're probably going to be shorting at about the time uh, we are hitting a bottom in the market. Not a good idea. Instead, wait for the volatility index to, to move lower. When the volatility drops back into the uh, last couple bear markets, when it gets down to 16, anything in the teens, and you see uh, movement back up to key areas of resistance, that's generally going to be a pretty good sign that um, – you know, you've got a, a, the timing on your short trades is, is going to be pretty good. All right. Now, let's take a look. I'm going to move forward and take a look at where we are right now. Um, and let me get a quick update just to make sure I have the last price. Yeah, you can see right now the S&P 500 after gapping up earlier today is essentially back down to where we were at the, uh, yesterday's close. So big reversal off of uh, support. But we have rallied back up, gapped up today, and so far failing, although uh, technically we are still up a half of a point on the S&P 500. So when we take a look at this, now this is a little bit more condensed because I'm only showing you one year, so it doesn't quite give you the, the bigger picture. But this gives you everything you need to see. We moved up. We set a key high. Here was that first high volatility move to the downside. The VIX went all the way up to 37 on the close. I think intraday it got to 50 or 51. And when you see a, a, a bottom print with a volatility index that high, that becomes a major support level, in my opinion. Um, that is a baby throwing out, thrown out with the bathwater kind of a bottom. Market, very fearful. A um, lot of sellers out there. Panicked sell-offs are critical support levels for the stock market as we go forward. And I think that's been proven out uh, or proven throughout 2018. After we set that initial low, the close was 2582. We have not seen a close below it, but we have tested it. And each time we test it, in my opinion, it just makes that support level stronger and stronger and a breakdown below it more significant. So here was your, your move down in February to set the low with high volatility. Here's your April low coming down to test it. Also with a spike up into the mid 20s on the VIX, just recently in October, when we came all the way down back to 2600, you can see the VIX back up into the mid 20s again. And now with the pullback uh, recently, uh, yesterday, I, don't know, I think we hit 25 or 26, but because we had that rally at the end of the day, the close came back down to around 23 or so. Uh, but this was up in the 25, 26 area when we hit this low and came down. We just didn't close down here. So the volatility index backed off a little bit. But each time we've come down here, it's been very volatile. Um, I believe if this is a bear market, we're going to see the following take place. First, and I'm just giving you the steps here, we're going to see a breakdown below 2582. To me, that is the initial confirmation of a bear market. A uh, lot of signs out there. A lot of my colleagues here at Stock Charts already calling a bear market. I certainly think it's possible. A lot of things have deteriorated over the past couple of months from where we were back at the beginning of 2018. But I don't buy into the bear market theory until we break down below these lows. Otherwise, I consider it a correction. So step 1A for me is a breakdown. 1B is a breakout in the VIX. If we break down below this low, I have a feeling we're going to see uh, this turn into a, quite an emotional market. A lot of folks are going to be panicking, and as a result, we are going to see the volatility index explode to the upside. I think that will be the combination that will confirm this as a bear market. Once that happens, then I'm not, again, I'm not going to be rushing in to buy stocks. I mean, you can see the RSI right now is already at 40, and if we break down, the, we're going to be oversold. So I don't know how far we go. I will say, that when the volatility index moves higher, 
that tends to lead to a lot of impulsive selling. And when I say impulsive selling, a lot of sellers and not many buyers. And we've seen what that looks like. Um, in about two weeks, we went from an all-time high back down what uh, from 2870 down to 2580. So that was 290 points. That was about a 10% move or a correction in two weeks. That's a huge move down in two weeks. But we've seen it multiple times. Every time the VIX starts to move higher, we get into this impulsive selling type environment where the moves to the downside are just explosive, um, multiple percent in a day, three, four, five percent. And if you're on the long side, that becomes very painful. And if you have a, if you're waiting until the close to, uh, you know, exercise your stops, you know, if you're waiting until uh, 350, 355 to see what your stock's doing, you're probably waiting too long. Uh, one of the changes I always make is when we get into a more volatile market, when the VIX is up in the 20s, I use intraday stops. I don't take any chances holding it. You know, the market might whipsaw and it might, you know, I might get stopped out and my stock reverse, but I don't want to take any chances to the downside. So I'm almost always going to trade with an intraday stop, given the high, high volatility, um, those types of uh, conditions and that kind of an environment. All right. So. Let's watch for that breakdown, 2582. Uh, look for the VIX to step up through the mid 20s, probably head into the upper 20s, maybe even into the 30s. Um, ultimately, the last final low will be the one that scares everyone out of the market for multiple years, and that one will occur probably with a VIX in the 40s. But this is, would be the initial step, in my opinion. Now, step two is the important one, because after I confirm that there's a bear market, I get the breakdown, volatility confirms it, then I'm, I'm going to wait for that bounce, because that initial bounce is where I think the best setups are going to occur to short. So it could be that after we drop on the PPO, we get that move back up to test the center line, remember? And maybe as the 50-day moving average continues dropping, maybe it comes down here to about 2640, we get back up, and and I wouldn't be surprised to go back through 2582, by the way. Um, that would not surprise me. It's happened in the last two bear markets where we've gone back above that prior level of support that was so important. Eventually, we went back up through it. We did get through that resistance level, and that creates more buyers coming in and then the next shoe drops. So we want to watch, I think, for a move back up on the PPO close to the center line. If it were to go through, and then roll back over, as I showed you on a couple of those other charts, I think that would be critical uh, on a move back to the downside. All right, and then of course 2B, um, in addition to that move back up in the S&P 500 to give me a much better reward to risk opportunity, I also wanna see the VIX begin to settle down. And we know in the last two bear markets, the VIX never goes below 16, 17. We need a certain level of anxiety um, and emotion in the market, and a certain level of, of uh, bearishness, nervousness, um, because when you get a bad report, that's the kind of emotional makeup in the market that drives prices lower. So those are some of the things I'm going to be looking for. Let's get the, the breakdown on the S&P, the breakout on the VIX, and then let both of them uh, kind of settle down, the VIX back down. Maybe it doesn't get all the way to 16, 17, but you should see it drop, drop probably some, somewhere around the 20 area. And at the same time, we should get a, a move higher in prices to set up a much better reward to risk trade. Okay, now yesterday, if you were listening to the show, I went through a number of stocks um, and that was during a, um, well, I think during the Monday setups, uh, I, I talked about a few stocks on the short side and then went into earnings spotlight and talked about, I don't know, maybe another eight or 10 stocks, individual stocks. So if you didn't see that show, I'm not going to bring those stocks up again. You can always go back uh, and check out the recording from yesterday. So I'm going to give you a different list. It comes from um, my group of companies that have already missed top and bottom line estimates. But these companies uh, are not the ones I discussed yesterday. So if you want additional uh, candidates, again, go back and look at that recording from yesterday. But let's take a look at some of the individual stocks that I'll be looking at if we get the confirmed breakdown and that rally. Um, one of them will be MD. And by the way, if you're sitting back saying, well, does that mean you don't trade at, at all during a bear market except when you get these bounces? No, 
just like during a bull market, I'm going to trade. I'm not going to wait for the overall market necessarily to come back to a certain level before I'll trade individual stocks. But I'm not going to be aggressive on the short side as long as I feel like there's upside potential in the market. Once I feel like the market has rolled over and I have a much better chance of going lower than higher, that's where I'm going to get more aggressive. So I think, you know, once the, the downtrend is confirmed, you'll find individual stocks that are at key resistance levels that's okay to short. I would just simply short fewer shares. So I would watch my position size and I would probably not have too many positions at once. So I'll be, I'd be trying to make a little bit of money on the short side because we are in that kind of an environment, but I wouldn't be overly aggressive on the short side until I feel like the market is ready to turn. Because if you think about it, if you ever been in the ocean and tried to swim into the current, it's really hard to do it. But if you turn around and swim with the current, you can swim really fast. And that's kind of the thinking with the market. Once you get to the point where the, the S&P bounces and it starts to roll over and turn lower, you're going to be able to swim on the short side a lot faster to the downside if the market is moving lower. It's, it's actually a little bit of bad luck if you're not making money on shorts when the market is dropping. So let's take a look at some individual stocks and some things to, to watch. Uh, notice with uh, MD, Mednex, gap down with poor earnings. The rally comes up and hits key resistance. Now, if we're in a bear market or we think, or I think we've in it, we're in a bear market, we've confirmed that breakdown. Um, even if we haven't bounced in the overall market, if I see an individual stock that comes up close to its 20-day moving average and filling a gap like this, that would be a pretty good indication where I could get in and have a fairly solid reward to risk. Now, again, I'm going to probably trade fewer shares because if the S&P 500 were to move higher, you know, this might not get through, but it, it might. It just, to me, um, offers up a little bit more uncertainty with the trade. So I would trade fewer shares. But I think if you get back up above 41 into this area near gap resistance, that's uh, the time potentially to short the stock. Now, looking out a little bit further, you can see a nice reversing candle. Stock got up close to 41, put in a bearish engulfing candle. The next day, the stock was down about 4% at the low before it rallied. But I think overall, we've got a downtrending stock, a company that already disappointed Wall Street, missing its top line and bottom line. And so if the market moves lower, this is the type of stock I expect will move lower as well. All right, uh, let's keep going. Got a few, actually, I got a number of stocks, and I'll try to pick up the pace here a little bit. Um, all scripts, MDRX, big gap down with, with uh, earnings, heavy volume. Uh, we went back up, set it a, a reaction high. So I think that becomes a very important resistance level. But this was a stock that struggled at the 20-day. First time it hit the 20-day, failed, came back down. Now it's back up, trying to get through the 20 again. Um, I'm not sure it's going to get through. If I was playing the 20-day moving average as my key resistance level, I could keep a pretty tight stop. If it breaks above the 20 and holds on a closing basis, I would be out of it. Um, ultimately, a move back up to 1050 to 1080 would probably be best reward to risk entry on a short side into MDRX. All right, Universal Display, OLED, big gap down. Now, it's been on a little bit of a run here over the past few weeks. I don't think it's going to last. I think this huge gap down right here, recovery back up to about 103. I think that has set a major resistance area. And look at where the 50-day moving average is sitting right now, 103. So this is the kind of stock that if we broke down in the market and then we rallied in the market and OLED somehow managed to get back up to about 102 and a half, 103, I think that would be a great area for a short entry and you could keep a tight stop. I, and for me, on an intraday basis even, I think a move back up above about 105. I wouldn't want to take a chance of it just getting away from me. Keep in mind, again, from a short per shorting perspective, it is very emotional. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. It's emotionally draining to be in on a short position and lose money. <clears throat> Hold on one second. Okay, sorry about that. <clears throat> so it's just emotionally draining to be in a short position when the market is going up and you're losing money on a short. I, I don't know. I can't speak for everyone else. I just know for me, those are the worst kinds of trades. If I'm long and the market's going down and I'm losing money, that's kind of normal. I mean, it's just going to happen. 
But shorting and losing money and markets going against you and going higher, uh, that takes a toll on me. So I, I tend to keep tight stops. And again, I trade fewer shares. I, I don't take the same uh, risks on the short side that I do on the long side. All right, let's take a look at another stock, TEX. <clears throat> All right, this is Terex Corp. Now, check out this right here. This move up hits the 50-day moving average, comes back down. And this, by the way, was your gap down with earnings in early November. We made our way all the way back up. We didn't get to the top of gap resistance, but we did get to the 50-day and printer reversing candle. So the 50-day, I mean, if your timing was perfect, would have been a great entry. Um, it wouldn't have been unreasonable to maybe take a small position at the 50-day. And if it got up to 36, fill out the position. Um, a close over 36 or an intraday move up above, say, 37 would have taken me out of the position. <coughs> Those are some of the things I would have been looking at. To the downside, though, after that reversing candle, it was straight down to test that prior low. That's a pretty nice gain in just a couple of days. So those are the types of things that I would be looking for on a short trade. All right, let's take a look at ACHC. <clears throat> All right, ACHC, and I'm going to annotate this one. To me, 35 and 36 was major resistance for a couple of reasons. So there's 35, there's 36. So once we had uh, this move down, we established that low close, we bounced back up. When you come back down and take out that prior close, it becomes resistance. So 36 is kind of where I would, I would say, well, maybe it'll get up that high. First test, though, is it's 20-day. And on this low right here, first, check out the volume. Volume trends are horrendous. The PPO is awful at the most recent low. <clears throat> so this uh, reaction high, this move back up is a perfect opportunity to establish a short position. 35 to 36 would have been the range I would have been looking for. Uh, now, again, I'm not shorting it. And I didn't short it when it moved back up because I'm not going to short until I have a bear market confirmed. Some might short. A lot of people short during bull markets. I don't. I don't do anything until I don't do anything on the short side until I'm. I feel that the bear market has been confirmed. And when you look back at those prior bear markets, by the way, um, you have uh, a lot of opportunities to the downside after you get that price breakdown. It wasn't. It's not like you see the breakdown in the bear market's over. The bear market's just beginning if that price breaks down, in my opinion. So you got a lot of opportunities to the short side. I think while you're consolidating, it's probably one of the more difficult markets to trade because you really don't know if, you're, if you should be buying uh, based on the fact that we're in a, a, an extended bull market or if you should be selling because a lot of the signs are pointing to a bear market. Uh, the volatility index goes through the roof. You get impulsive selling. The emotional aspect of trading in a correction or a bear market is very difficult. I know some traders would completely disagree with me, but I've said it before. My ideal uh, trading environment is one where the VIX is down around 9 or 10. And you get those days where the Dow goes up 26 points one day and 72 points the next day, drops back 15, then goes up 40. You know, those boring days, the boring market that just keeps going higher, that's when I like to trade. This craziness, back and forth, impulsive moves, don't know if the Dow is going to be up 600 or down 400 by the close, that's gambling. That's not trading to me. That's just gambling. So you want to keep that in mind. I want to show you one more stock, and then we'll wrap this up. All right, let's take a look at um, CWH. This is uh, Camping World. And by the way, I think CWH was on my strong earnings chart list not that long ago. But now it is on my weak earnings uh, list. And uh, they reported earnings, I think it was right here on this heavy volume move down. Now, before they reported earnings and went down and tested support, you can see that last reaction high right here was about 19 and a half. See all these tails right in here? What that tells you is the buyers just evaporated there. Now you gap down and about three weeks later, look at what happens. The exact same thing. It's almost a mirror image of these tails, 19 and a half. Also notice it's at the 20, or excuse me, 50 day moving average. So now you've got a lot of 
of technical indications that tell you that probably it's going to go lower. And if it doesn't, you could put a, a stop in above 20. So again, you can keep your stops really tight. That's the, that's the value of, of being patient and allowing these stocks to get back up close to resistance levels because I can keep my stop tight. And if I'm right, look at what happens over the next three days. I mean, if you're selling at 19, 19 and a half, and you're buying down around 17 or 16, 75, that's a nice gain. And for those of you, again, who are unfamiliar with shorting, and you're sitting here wondering, all right, what does this mean to short? Uh, essentially, what you do when you short is you are borrowing someone else's shares and you're selling them with the idea that the stock is going to go down, you're going to buy their shares back, and you're going to give them back to them. So, uh, that's the whole idea with shorting is you want to borrow shares and profit on the way down. And then once you get to that price point where you have you know feel like you've got enough profit, you buy them back and you simply return the shares. Now, you don't physically do all that. The broker does it for you. Um, but you do, in essence, borrow shares, sell them, wait for the, the move back down. In this case with CWH, you're borrowing someone's shares at $19.50. They're holding them but you don't think it's a good idea to hold it. You would, you see this as an opportunity for the price to go down. So you borrow their shares, you sell them. And when it gets down to 17, you buy them back and you hand them back to the people. They don't know the difference because they've been holding the whole time. It's really just a brokerage type transaction. They do it all for you. Uh, but that's the whole idea is to profit during a downtrending market. Now the market stock market goes up a lot more than it goes down. And there are some perma bears out there. And I think those who have a negative um, approach to the market on a regular basis. I don't know how they make money. Maybe they can do it. I, I don't know how you can do it because again, you're swimming against the tide most of the time, but during bear markets, you are swimming with the tide and that's the whole idea. So let's uh, just pull up the uh, summary slide here. Again, you know, we looked at the benchmark S and P 500 showed you the last two bear markets, how we had key support levels that continued to hold for about a year. And then we had a breakdown, and that is what triggered the continuing lower lows, lower highs. You've got to get that first lower low, and that's the key. That's why, in my opinion, that support level is so important. We haven't seen that yet. Uh, then the keys going forward, exercise patience, real, realizing, recognizing that bear markets are emotional. And as a result, the volatility index becomes your guide and is your friend. Um, you don't want to be shorting when the VIX is up in the upper 20s and into the 30s. Now, maybe the VIX goes to 40 and whoever's in is probably going to make a lot of money on the short side during that move. But just keep in mind and remember, the VIX turns a lot of times in the 20s or and low 30s. So you want to make sure you're watching the VIX. If it's too, in it, too emotional of a market, I don't think it's a good idea to be shorting at that point. Stick with uh, underperforming sectors and industries. We didn't really talk about that a whole lot. But when you pull up a chart list, if you know there's an area of the market that's underperforming, say it's software, you could just type into a box software and it brings up all your software stocks within that chart list, um, which is a powerful tool. Uh, consider smaller position sizes and gains. Uh, I always look at the market. If I can make money when the market's going down, I don't need to stretch it out. I don't need to try and get every little dollar last cent out of that trade. If I short and two days later, I'm up four or 5% on the trade, even though I think it could go down 10%, sometimes I'll just take it, move back to cash, and I made money while the market was dropping. Um, and then finally, establish that desirable um, uh, reward to risk, R2R. Reward to risk is important, and that kind of uh, goes along with that exercising patience, allowing these trades to set up. So I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, I, on the one hand, I hope we don't break down. I don't want to, I don't like trading a bear market. I would much rather trade a bull market, but uh, I think it's timely right now, given everything going on in the market that uh, we consider uh, what could happen if we get this breakdown. Absolutely. Excellent. Thank you. I know I learned a lot because <laughs> yes. I typically don't short. Uh, like you said, I have, uh, but typically I don't mainly because we've been in bull market situation now for so long really hasn't been any need to. Yeah, I think when you look back over the last uh, nine, 10 years during this bull market, I know 2010 and 2011 were rough because we were still coming out of the that wicked bear market where 
you know, we had the financial crisis and nobody trusted anything. The volatility index remained high at that level. Um, so it's really hard, uh, you know, to, uh, you know, kind of keep in perspective those moves that were made back in 2010 and 2011. But outside of that, the only time that we've really had anything similar to what we're going through right now is 2016. And we managed to hold on to support there and the bull market resumed. So that's why I, I agree that there are a lot of bad signs in the market right now and that we could be in the midst of a, uh, you know, in the grips already of a bear market. Um, and I respect everybody that's made that call, but I need to see this breakdown to confirm it before I'm going to start trading like it's a bear market. And so, uh, you know, until we get that breakdown, I still think that there's an outside chance that we hold this area or maybe have one more false breakdown and then move to the upside. So just consider it as a possibility before getting too bearish. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, you know, somebody did mention, you know, if you short a stock and then the next morning you find out like Apple bought it and it gaps up like 200%, you really can be in a lot of trouble when you're shorting. Do you um, uh, recommend shorting ETFs uh, because of that? Personally, if I'm going to uh, use an ETF, I'd probably just use a, a bear fund. Yeah, um, I, I've done both. Um, I can tell you that if you're shorting an individual stock and the market goes down and your stock goes the wrong way and you lose money during a market that's going down and you're shorting, you know, you think you're on the right side of the trade, that can get really frustrating. Um, so sometimes if, you know, it makes sense, you know, where I talked about uh, considering smaller positions, uh, position sizes, another consideration would be ETF. So if you think the S&P 500 is going to go lower, uh, maybe trading something like the SH, which is the ETF that shorts the S&P 500. So if the S&P goes down 1%, the SH goes up 1%. That can make, make sense. Um, and you can keep stops fairly tight. Yeah, I think it's probably a good way to hedge too when you're a little bit concerned um, that that can work. I know a lot of people anyway who do that. All right. Well, oh my gosh, 950. So, oh my gosh. Okay. We better get started with that 10 in 10. So yep. let me share that RRG very quickly so you can get a glass of water and wet your whistle here. All right. So here's the RRG. One of the things I noticed that I wanted to point out were all of these that were leading that are now really heading, heading toward lagging in a, in a very, uh, really quickly, it looks like. The ones we really want to pay attention to, at least as far as the RRG, are the ones moving in that northeast direction. And I think there's quite a few of them in here. Um, but don't worry, I, I do throw in all different kinds, make sure that we haven't looked at them in about a week and go vote because the most popular symbol will be the next one. So let's go with Walmart. All right, um, one second. Mm-hmm. Let's see. All right. All right. So on Walmart, first of all, we're really close to a key support. So this would be a stock if you were thinking about, hey, I still want to be on the long side in case this market moves higher. I think Walmart would be one of the stocks that would kind of fit that criteria. I mean, after gapping up back in August, we've pulled back. We've established very solid support. I'm going to say, you know, 92 and a half to 93 dollars as you look at these lows. And we're down there again. So if the market breaks down and Walmart moves, say, below 92, you could get out with a fairly you know, uh, minimal damage to the downside. So if I was looking at stocks to potentially be in in case we reverse back to the upside, I think Walmart would be a poster child for one that I would consider because it is in an uptrend. We've continued putting in higher highs, higher lows. It has held so far uh, some pretty key short-term support. Um, if we get in the bear market and we move lower, chances are Walmart's going to lose its uh, support area and I would get stopped out. But this is one that I think uh, I could argue to stay on the long side. All right. The most popular in the chat room is Canada Goose Holdings, G-O-O-S. Yeah, Goose, this one is, uh, I, don't, I don't like this one right now. I don't like the fact it failed to hold gap support from back in November. We had that gap up, I think it was on November 14th, you can see, with that black candle. So here is where we had gapped up from. It looked like we were making a breakout. Everything looked really good on the stock. And we came back down and we failed to hold the gap support. That's And this recent price support. 
Today, with the market opening strong, it gapped up. It's already moved into negative territory. Volume today is heavy. Um, if it breaks down below yesterday's low, I would certainly be out of it. I wouldn't take any chances. This is a high growth stock. And if we're going into a bear market, these are the kinds of stocks that are going to get hit hard. So there was your gap support here. There, This was the prior, the most recent low. And you can see we've taken both of those out. And when you look down to where could this thing go, well, we had pretty much a straight move up. So I would, I mean, it's possible we go back down to 47. So I don't think I would be looking at this stock at this point from a long perspective. Again, something like Walmart, I think is less risky and uh, makes more sense if you're trying to maybe trade the market on the long side. I would avoid Goose right now. All right. Next one I have for you for our Canadian friends, Bank of Nova Scotia, bns.to. Okay. Uh, well, I don't like this failure at resistance. I would just be watching the recent low close around 71 and a quarter um, or a recent candle body. Because if you go back down below that low level, you lose the 20 day moving average. So, um, you can see clearly we were in a move to the downside. The PPO was negative territory. Here's an example where we break out. The PPO goes slightly above the center line. If we were to move back down below these moving averages and fail to hold on to support and the PPO goes negative, I don't want to take any chances. I do like the heavy volume breakout here, and this may have been earnings related because I think the stock reported earnings recently. Uh, but here, that breakout is, is pretty good. That was above this high. So let's just say 71 and a quarter, 71 and a half. We want to hold this level. I don't like this test of the recent candle body and failure. But for now, you could just call it sideways consolidation. But a loss of 71 and a quarter, I think, starts to look a little bit more bearish. You got another one? I'm sorry, I'm making my coughs going on too. <laughs> <laughs> All right. How about Herbalife, HLF? All right. HLF. Now, this one, I think, is uh, showing some bullish characteristics. Um, and even in a bear market, you will have areas of the market that will do well. Um, when you look across here, look at all of these intraday moves. And I would maybe even draw the line all the way back up to this area right in here. But look at all of these tops that came in between about 55 and a half and 56. Couldn't get through. And then finally we get through and the volume confirms that move. That's what I like to see. Now, if I saw a move like this and I looked down and the volume was light, I would pay no attention to it. It just wouldn't get my interest. So when I talk about volume confirming price action, this is what I mean. Lots of overhead resistance. When you get through, that should trigger a lot of buying. You should see the volume pick up. In this case, it did. And notice when it pulled back, it held the area of the breakout and it also held the 20-day um, uh, moving average. So let me just show that right there. So here was your price support because there was your breakout. And so you came back down, tested both price support and the 20-day. If we were in a bull market, uh, well, we are in a bull market. If we were trending higher and I wasn't concerned about this correction or possibly the bear market, a uh, 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 move like this with heavy volume and a test of that 20-day would be a buy for me every time. So I think it is, it's definitely exhibiting some bullish tendencies here. Um, as long as it continues to trade with the PPO rising and the rising 20-day holding is support, I like it. All right. Excellent. Uh, let's see. How about Canopy Growth? Haven't looked at that one in a little while. CGC, of course. All right. CGC. Well, you're down into some key gap support area um, from all the way back in August. So all of that hype that was on a lot of these stocks, um, you know, we've seen them come back down. I know Kronos is one uh, exception. Uh, Kronos has been performing pretty well, but many of these uh, cannabis stocks have come back down to where they took off from back in August. And that's uh, exactly what's happened here to CGC. So I think as you get closer into this 2530 area from a, somebody who's maybe more interested from a longer term perspective on a stock that, you know, has been pretty good, uh, this is one that I think kind of makes sense. And as we move lower, you can see the PPO starting to turn more positive. So I think CGC looks pretty good. Um, but uh, I think it's got more room to the downside. So in a market that like this, that is, 
in correction territory, possibly bear market. I'm not going to get a stock at $32 that I think easily could move down into the 25 to 28, 29 range. Um, even though it's got a lot of upside, I would still wait personally. Uh, some that are maybe a little more impatient, want to get in on this, this weakness, I would simply say maybe to get in over time. So maybe a small position at the current price. And then if it were to drop into the 20s, maybe build your position, use that weakness to build a position. Okay, excellent. Uh, our only utility that was, was requested, AEP. Okay, uh, this one looks good now. And we've talked about this quite a bit on Market Watchers Live, how if you're going to trade on the long side, a lot of the more defensive stocks look better technically. And this is what's holding the market up. I mean, this is why this is one of the reasons why the S&P 500 has not broken down. A lot of money still rotating into utilities. So, and along with consumer staples and real estate. But there was a breakout that we saw in November. We came back down, tested it. Look at this test, price support and the 20-day moving average. Both tested at the same time. They hold, stock continues moving higher. Now, if you're gonna trade these uh, utilities, you just have to understand they're not technology stocks. They don't move like that. So you're not going to be looking at, at least I would not be looking at trying to get a 10% move uh, in five days or even in a few weeks. Uh, these, these stocks tend to move much more slowly and you might consider a three or 4% gain to be a really good move in a stock like this. But again, that's, you know, when you're in a highly volatile market, these are some of the things you should be thinking about is maybe trading stocks like AEP that uh, don't carry nearly as much risk. All right. Let's see. Consumer discretionary home improvement retailer, Beacon Roofing Supply. B-E-C-N. Yeah, this one, uh, I, I love this move back to the upside, but it did hit overhead resistance. This one's going to be interesting to see whether or not the 20-day holds because overall you have a downtrend in play. And if you look at this low right here, when we went below, see the gap down with increasing volume, look at the failures back at 35 and right here, bearish engulfing candle. So I see a longer term downtrend, short term above the 20 day. I would simply just say if this stock closes back below that 20 day moving average, I would be careful given the overall downtrend and the fact that it reversed right at price resistance. Okay, let's see. Uh, somebody was asking in the chat room uh, for XLF and your opinion on why it might be having problems right now. Oh, well, it's easy. 10-year treasury yield. I mean, you know, the, the talk of the yield curve, um, you know, inverting, all of that uh, plays a, a big negative role in earnings for banks and life insurance companies. So those are the two. If you look at their charts, banks and life insurance companies, both have been getting hit, hit very hard. And they are the primary reasons why financials are uh, under such selling pressure right now. So when I looked at the 10-year treasury yield earlier and we're not seeing any kind of a bounce, well, a lot of the other areas of the market are bouncing. Financials are struggling because we're not seeing any kind of movement to the upside in that 10-year treasury yield. And it's also a sign of economic weakness ahead. So financials, unfortunately, get the one-two punch when, <clears throat> when the 10-year treasury yield drops. All right, let's see, next one. Actually, the uh, no, we have two more. Uh, Adobe, uh, I guess they report Thursday is what they were saying. Uh, what do you think about it? Uh, yeah, it's uh, coming up for earnings. I don't hold into earnings, so that would be an easy decision for me. I'd be getting out of it. Um, I will say that many of the software companies do continue to report some pretty strong results. So if you're someone who doesn't mind holding into earnings, you know, you could certainly take a shot with Adobe. Uh, this is a great long-term company. If from a longer-term perspective, I have no problems holding Adobe. Uh, I'm just, you know, from a short-term perspective, that's where I have some issues. So I think in the near term right now, we've got some pretty good gap support, price support right at about 237. You've got the uh, double top. These reaction highs came in at about 261. We're sitting in the middle of this range. Hopefully, after earnings, we either get a gap up above the resistance or the gap down stays confined within this trading range because of it. If we gap down below, say 236, my guess is we're going to go back and test these lows down around 210. I still love the company long term, but if we go into a bear market, uh, bear market doesn't really care for too many aggressive 
growth type companies. So I think Adobe would probably uh, be in trouble longer term or well, more intermediate term in terms of a bear market. All right. And our very last one from the defense industry, Aerovironment, A-V-A-V. -A -V. Yeah, breakdown here. And I think I'm pretty sure this was earnings related. I don't think that they missed top and bottom line because I don't, I'm pretty sure this did not go on my earnings miss list. <clears throat> but I do think there are a couple areas to watch on any kind of a bounce on the stock. If you wanted to short it, I would not be long. Um, at this point, I just, there's too much volume, you know, it broke down heavy volume. So I think any kind of move back up to either test that 20 day or possibly even get back up to about 85, I think would be an opportunity to short the stock. So I'm not a fan. All right. Not uh, hearing you, Aaron. All right. You made it through the 10 and 10 and a workshop and your voice is still somewhat there. Congratulations. Yeah, I made it. <laughs> Here are the symbols that Dom annotated today. They will be in the Market Watchers Live chart list. Just go to the Blogs tab, click on the Market Watchers Live blog, and the link will be right there at the top. You can save those to your own chart lists uh, or do whatever it is you'd like to do with them. All right, time for our final market update. Let's go ahead and see what has been going on. And what I'm seeing is it, it's not so good. Uh, so. Let's see what we can do here. All right. So as you can see, you know, the markets opened with a nice gap continuation of the rally that we saw starting in the uh, about lunchtime yesterday, but it's failing now. And we're starting to see a lot of the, the major indexes hit negative territory now. And uh, obviously that's not what we wanna see right now. Russell 2000 is still staying positive though. Uh, up 70, well, a little bit, 70.7, uh, 1443.80 is what we're looking at, Russell 2000. Mid caps also staying on the positive side and the NASDAQ barely holding there. Uh, TSX is now uh, venturing into negative territory and TNX, treasury yields still not really moving that much, currently reading 2.861%. The VIX is up to 2290 right now. So we are rising from the beginning of the day. We've got UUP, the dollar is up, but pulling back slightly, uh, down seven cents for you at UUP. And gold is down slightly, but it looks like it wants to get back into positive territory where it did spend some of the morning. GLD is at 117.61. USO, big gap up, uh, starting to fall back though. Uh, looks like we're, it looks like we might've found some intraday support at 1090. Uh, currently it's at 1095 for USO. and. Finally, uh, TLT, uh, Treasury yields, uh, I'm sorry, the Treasury, 20-year Treasury bond ETF, we could see is up slightly, uh, you know, rounded off uh, intraday and is heading back down, but still up 26 cents at 119.16. And that's all I have for the market update. Uh, what do you have for us, Tom? I'll get the scans ready. All right. Uh, I'm just going to follow up on that Russell 2000 chart. One thing, uh, you know, keep talking about the S&P 500 and we're trying to hold on to support. I did want to show you, though, that uh, the area of support, we had not had a close below 1460 on the Russell 2000 and the breakout occurred around 1450. And you can see a lot of the activity here in these past couple of days taking place below the support level. So even though we haven't seen the benchmark S&P 500 drop below, key support from back in February. That is not the case with the Russell 2000 small caps. And again, that's uh, not painting a great picture for the economic outlook ahead here in the US. So warning sign. Yes, lots of them out there right now. Uh, or as Carl likes to call them, attention flags. Mm -hmm. Something to get your attention you need to be thinking about. All right, well, let's go ahead and move into technical scans. I'll go over just a few uh, scanning techniques and maybe some things you didn't know about scanning. So let's go ahead and start ourselves off right there. All right, so we're just on the member homepage. And if you go to your settings, the little gears up here, you can add scans and alerts to your homepage. You want to have that checked if you're going to be using your scans and alerts. It just makes it much easier for you to get to what you need. So I'm going to just arrow down here now, scroll down, I should say, 
to the scans. And there we go. So I have my scans already in here, uh, but let's go ahead. I want to start with the predefined scans. And, you know, we talk about the predefined scans and we usually are looking at our bullish technical indicators, but we also have bullish I mean, bearish technical indicators. So you can use these in the bear market situation. And clearly you can see lots of stocks fitting the bill in these bearish technical indicators, whereas we're not seeing quite uh, the number up here on the bullish ones. So I wanted to show you just uh, how to get in there and, and maybe uh, manipulate them just a little bit. So first of all, if you don't wanna manipulate them or you're, you're not of a, uh, a subscription level that you can. Uh, one of the things you can do is look up here and you can see uh, it is separated out into you know the different exchanges and whether it's mutual funds or not. So you can just go down here and if you want just the NYSE, you can get uh, just go to one and get that 133. But I'm gonna take the 550. Let's start with all of them. Well, first of all, we know there's going to be problems in terms of the exchanges. I don't want those. Uh, I don't like to have uh, penny stocks or anything that's really low uh, to invest in. You can see some up here at the top. So what I want to do is I'm just going to edit this. And that way I only get the information that I really want uh, from this. So for example, we know it's a stock and then here's the volume because that's what we're talking about as far as the new uh, lows go. What I'm going to add into this is that I want it to be from the U.S. exchange. So I'm going to go here to country. And I'm going to add and look at it automatically does go to country as U.S. Uh, I want to find something where the price is. Um, let's see, I can get that over here. So I'm going to add that I want the close to be greater than let's just say uh, $10 right now. All right, that gives me pretty much, uh, that's gonna narrow down quite a bit uh, the, the stuff that I don't really want when I go and look in that predefined scan. So let's run it and see what we get as far as our results. I remember we had 550 before, now we're down to 130. So that makes life a little easier when you're gonna go and start looking uh, for your stocks uh, your possibilities out there. So you can of course add the scooter and you, know, you can add all different kinds of things, but this is one, one way to just quickly uh, narrow down all of the stocks that are coming through on those predefined scans. So I'm gonna go back and we're gonna look at a different scan. All right, so I'm looking at the technical indicators. I'm gonna do the strong volume decliners. Now we're already starting with only 49, so this one should be um, interesting in my opinion as to what we might get because we should be able to narrow it down and see uh, what we have as far as, you know, getting just a handful of stocks that might be interesting. So first of all, ticker properties, country, add, country is US, price, close, add, and I want to make it $10. All right, now I'm going to run it. And we're down to 12. So that makes life a lot easier. Uh, I would, what I generally do is I replace an existing chart list with my results. And I recommend that you have like a transitional chart list. I call mine scan dump. I just dump all of it in there. I know that anything in there is not going to stay there. So I don't annotate or anything while I'm in, you know, while those are in that scan dump chart list. I pull what I want out of that. Uh, so I know I'm going to constantly be rewriting it. So I'm going to add that there. And like I said, now we have 12. And then I like to go to my candle glance. And now I can really evaluate them based on my uh, signals, which would be the 20, 50, and 200 day EMAs, because that determines the short term or the long term and the intermediate term trend models and their signals. So, for example, uh, ACOR, Accorda Therapeutics, uh, you can see we have that 50, 200 day negative crossover, which moves this stock into what Decision Point considers a bear market configuration 
when you have a stock in a bear market configuration, you can start expecting bearish results. And if you're looking for a shorting opportunity, uh, that's what you want. So I wanted to look at what are the possibilities here. What which ones look interesting just based on my PMO and on you know the way that these are set up. And right now you can see we already got the breakdown on ACOR. Uh, so I'm not going to look at that one. This we have a top below the signal line and it is still on its way down. We're sitting at really interesting support here. Uh, let's see A B N R Y. Hmm. This one looks very low volume as well, but I'm on uh, the support level. So I might be thinking about adding it to a watch list if I'm gonna go with a short, because if I get that breakdown and it uh, confirms this PMO cell signal and you can see the negative volume coming in, uh, we should have an opportunity there if we wanted to go ahead and short. All right, let's look at a few more here. This one we've already gotten the breakdown. All right, so let's take a peek at this. John Hancock, JHMD. Uh, as you can see, I, unfortunately, well, no, it's not, it's pretty good volume on this one. We have gotten that breakdown. Um, I know this looks like a double top, but double tops are reversal patterns and we were already in a decline. So I'm not gonna look at that. Uh, what I would pay attention to is that rising bottoms trend line. We got the gap down below it. Uh, can't seem to get back above the close we have back here uh, from mid-November. All of these things are pretty negative on this chart and something to consider when you are looking for a short. And I also like to look at these weekly charts uh, for many of these because I really want a good idea of what's going on here. And of course, this one's a little bit of a newer one, but you can see this gap we had back here. And right now we're, we are closing it. Uh, that tells me that we could have uh, move more downside movement here. And the next area of support, maybe you could say right here at that um, second quarter low uh, in 2017. All right, so that was using the predefined scans. Let's go back and I'm gonna show you uh, one of my scans for what I call my scan for dogs. And if you wanna find this scan and read more about it, I did a blog article on March 17th in 2016, where I talked about uh, how you can scan for a few dogs. And yes, that, that's my dog and that's my daughter's dog. <laughs> I gave them a little bit of uh, play time, but here you go. So here's the scan. Uh, you can copy the information into your own, um, into your own scan, however you wanna do it. Uh, so there we go. So that's where you can find it. But let's go ahead now and look at it. I actually haven't run it today, so I'm kind of curious. If you recall yesterday for Monday setups, I ran my general PMO scan, which is my bullish scan, and I had zero results. Ah, I have one result today. Oh, it is the same one, Tom. Remember the VIX futures <laughs> was the only one I had on the buy side for my PM, general PMO scan. So really when I see that, um, I'm not going to go long. I, I, why would I do that? It's, you know, there's obviously not a lot of choices there. I need everything to be lined up the way I want. All right, but let's go back and look at my scan for dogs. All righty. Okay. So right now the, the dog scan is uh, only looking at the S&P 500 or the NASDAQ. Uh, you can change that, of course, to however you want it. I want the PMO to be falling and ha uh, continuing to fall, but I don't want it to yet, yet have that uh, crossover sell signal, if possible, because I do like to catch, uh, the signals do tend to lag somewhat, so I do like to catch those tops and bottoms on the PMO, so that's what that does. I want a scooter that's less than 75, because I consider 75 and above the hot zone, so I changed that. Uh, let's run it and see how many we get for this one. 34. So that does tell me there's some issues out there and shorting isn't necessarily a bad idea right now. And I think, you know, Tom gave us some really good strategies. And as one of our uh, viewers mentioned, you know, you really, the risk is really high on shorting and you just have to consider those really short, uh, you know, those stops, uh, tight uh, stops and that sort of thing. I, 
I will short in a bear market and I haven't actually gotten any shorts right now. I'm just uh, getting out of the market. Uh, I've got most of my intermediate and short term investments gone, just waiting for some good opportunities for the long term investments uh, to divest some of those. All right, so here's what we have though on our scan for dogs. I am going to replace my chart list. There we go. And now I have all those 34. I'm going to look at them in my candle glance. Like I said, I, I prefer that. And now I can take a peek and see which ones look particularly ugly. Now this one I think is interesting because we do have a, a possible double top here uh, on Abby V. Let's see. ABBV. All right, so oh, I don't know, I sort of a double top here, uh, but you can see the failure of the 20 to get above the 50. So we have a pretty uh, bearish configuration here. Uh, supports at about 85. So I would be watching that very closely uh, as a possibility of an area to get into a short. Um, I might even wait a little. I could kind of see maybe the formation, we're coming out of this rally right here and we could make a case, I mean, this is very early, but we could look at a possible uh, head and shoulders here with a left shoulder head and we're heading back up to a right shoulder. So again, a lot of things when I, I look at these, I'm looking for watch list. I'm not necessarily looking to get in right this second. And that goes for my longs as well. So just peeking down the list, um, I, I think there are a few uh, opportunities in here, but I'm got, not going to be, I'm not going to uh, concentrate on the stocks. I just really wanted you to see how the scans worked. Uh, and I think I've accomplished that. So uh, Zach out there, can we put up, pull up the poll? Because I did ask a question about scanning. I was curious how uh, our viewers used scanning and, you know, it, it's very interesting. You could pick more than one. Uh, oh yeah, here's our here's our slide for the summary. So I basically showed you how you could uh, use those bearish scans predefined, uh, and then I went all the way down through to get to my my personal favorite, my scan for dogs in a bear market. All right, so now we're going to bring up that poll. Uh, you can select as many as you want. I don't know if uh, if y'all knew that. Uh, interesting. Lots of people using, the, more than half, Tom, are using the custom scans, uh, which I think is, is great news. And uh, predefined as well, about a third. Yeah, I use both. Yeah, I, I use all of them. Um, and I have to say, uh, kind of um, on borrowed scans, just because I do steal some of those predefines, but I also go in and, and look at some of them that, that I've, I've seen previously uh, with Arthur and, and even Greg. So some interesting ones out there to borrow. And of course, you can always borrow mine. Well, sometimes too, if you pull up a predefined scan and then hit the, uh, um, I think it's a, a link at the upper right hand corner that says uh, something about edit the scan. Mm -hmm. um, then it gives you an idea of how that scan was written. So it can give you a lot of uh, information on writing scans in addition to actually giving you results from yeah, this. Yeah, a good idea. Yes, yeah. you can see what the, the language is when you use them. And also, like I was showing you, you can manipulate them enough to at least get the results you're really interested in looking at. Yep. All right. Uh, well, it is a wrap. I will say that the S&P 500 right now is down one point. So all of those earlier gains are gone. We're below the 20, uh, 20 hour EMA. Didn't come back in that hour and continuing to move lower. So I'm not, uh, not really liking the action. But anyway, I do want to thank everybody for being with us. Please remember to complete the survey as you exit. It is located just below your video player. Really like to hear how you all handle uh, shorting strategies. So uh, feel free to give us some feedback there. Market Watchers Live airs five days a week, Mondays through Fridays from noon to 1.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Have a great Tuesday afternoon, everybody. We'll see you back here tomorrow. Happy trading. Mm -hmm.